Thank you very much for the invitation to present today. Um, you've already given my introduction. So I'm going to be talking about chronic pain after surgery and where we've come really over the last 25 years. So fitting within the 25 year framework theme today. So I'm a researcher based at the Warwick Clinical Trials Unit. Um, and the good news is that the majority of patients who undergo surgery recover uneventfully, but there are a small proportion of patients who do experience chronic painful symptoms which can drastically impact on quality of life. So I'm going to talk about that um, for the next 15 minutes. So um, where do we start? We want to really start with a definition. So what do we mean by chronic pain after surgery? And the International Association for the Study of Pain, or the IASP group, they produce classification textbooks for different pain uh, syndromes. But if we go back 25 years ago, um, there is no actual definition, or certainly at that time, there was no definition for chronic pain after surgery. And it wasn't until criteria were proposed by colleagues from the University of Dundee, so Bill McRae and Hugh Davies, they were the first proposed criteria back in 1999. So they specified that the pain obviously must develop after an operation and that it should persist for two months or more after the procedure. Now this has subsequently been changed um, to three months, so that is generally the accepted definition now. But the other criteria were that you want to exclude wherever possible that the pain is due to any other reasons such as ongoing post-operative infection or ongoing malignancy. And also, wherever possible, you want to exclude whether the pain was fr from the underlying condition or from the reason why that the patient was having the procedure in the first place. Now, Tony has already given an excellent um, overview of the classification of the broad classification for the types of post-operative pain. So we know that there's nociceptive pain can occur and also neuropathic, but also there's a process of inflammation as well. So this is where the cytokines are activated and it drives the wound healing. So this is a necessary process. So, and certainly the nociceptive arises from the peripheral injury, so this relates to the tissue injury, and the neuropathic pain arises from um, damage to the nerves. And this can happen intraoperatively due to cautery or dissection or removal of tumour. Now these are very clean, distinct categories, so in clinical practice it can be very difficult to categorise and um, distinguish these uh, pain type, or sorry, pain classification by type. Um, and also the, the descriptors that patients use to describe their painful symptoms, they also vary. So the descriptors for neuropathic are very different from nociceptive type pain. So where have we come from? Um, what do we know about the burden of disease? So if we look back to the literature from the 1970s and also from the 1980s, there's really very little in the, the medical literature. There are some single case uh, reports and case studies, of small numbers of patients presenting at pain clinics and also uh, reports from neurologists for people with, um, for example, nerve entrapment syndrome. Um, and one of the first studies in the UK was a report in the BMJ in 1980, uh, in 1984. And this was by a couple of surgeons who were following up women two years after they'd had their mastectomy. Um, and they were returning back for their post-op review and they asked ladies whether they had any symptoms. So what type of symptoms um, they had in the, the area of their operation. And they found that 66% of them were uh, symptomatic. So, and the surgeons were actually quite surprised by this. Um, and they also found that the women were reluctant to report their symptoms unless they were asked. But I think we've come a long way now. We now know, we generally follow up patients, so we know a lot more about this uh, condition. So to give you another example of a seminal paper, so again, this is the colleagues from Dundee, 
and uh, this was a survey of patients attending chronic pain clinics so they asked the staff from 10 pain clinics across Scotland and across the north of England to record data on patients attending their clinics over the period of a year to find out the reason why they were attending and why they were seeking help. So they gathered data on over 5,000 patients and found that surgery was the second highest cause, so second to degenerative uh, problems. So this really was quite a staggering finding. Um, and also patients have often, by the time they get to see a pain consultant or specialist help, they've been to their GP, they've tried various different treatments. And in fact, they found that um, around about 60% of the patients in the survey had um, had their chronic pain for two years or more. So to jump forward, um, this is an example of a population study. So this is a, a large study that was conducted in Denmark by um, a surgical group and pain uh, anaesthetists as well. So this is a follow-up study of women who were entered on the national register. So all women in Denmark, when they undergo breast cancer surgery, they're recorded on the register. So they conducted a survey to identify what the pain prevalence was and also what the risk factors were. And they had almost 4,000 women eligible to follow up. And it was a cross-sectional study where they sent out a questionnaire and asked about the frequency of symptoms, the type of symptoms, and also recorded a pain intensity on a zero to 10 scale. And also they were interested in whether they had sought medical help uh, in the previous three months. So what did they find? So this was a high um, sample, so we have almost 90% of women responding to the survey. And it was really quite staggering, so that 50, almost 50% 50 of women are reporting pain in one or more areas two years after their operation, and 68, uh, sorry, almost 60% reporting sensory disturbances. And also a high proportion with moderate to severe pain, and about 10% of this population sample had also been to their GP in the previous month, even though they're two years post-operatively. And also this was one of the first sort of large studies to start to uncover the types of risk factors. So who is going to be most at risk? And they found that um, younger women and also the type of surgery was an important risk factor. And I think it's also interesting to note that this was published in the JAMA, which is a major medical journal. So we've really come quite a way um, from just a small report in the BMJ, almost like a research letter, to having a major uh, article in a major medical journal. So is it, I've given you a couple of um, examples from breast cancer surgery, but we now know more about other types of surgery as well. So this is another um, research study by a Danish group, and they undertook a systematic review where they've looked at, gathered all of the evidence, or looked at a lot of studies, almost 300 in total, and they've gone through these papers to look at what the estimates of chronic pain are. So the column on the right shows you the lower and then the upper value. So these um, percentages <coughs> vary because of differences in definitions used and different methodologies and different timing and follow-up. So what we have is thoracic and breast surgery at really at the top of the list here. And you can see the number of studies. So the literature is really beginning to grow here. But the take home message is around about 30% of patients are reporting uh, chronic pain symptoms. And also it's worth, Tony also mentioned hernia repair. So there's quite a lot more evidence now about um, hernia repair surgery as well. And they also looked at what proportion in these studies, so what proportion of patients are likely to report neuropathic symptoms. And again, thoracic and breast are at the top of the table here. So with around about two thirds of patients undergoing a thoracic or breast are likely to have neuropathic characteristics um, in their pain. 
So what about risk factors? So which patients are likely to be at higher risk? We, there are hundreds really of risk factors and we now know a lot more about these factors. So for example, surgical factors, duration of surgery, um, open procedures versus laparoscopic, so you're more likely to experience chronic pain after a more invasive procedure. Um, we know more about the psychological factors, so patients with increased anxiety, so those who are very anxious preoperatively are more likely to have more severe intensity acute postoperative pain and are also at greater risk of chronic pain as well. I've highlighted a couple in red here, so we know about pain history as an important factor, and again, that's something that Tony alluded to. So if somebody has a history of preoperative pain and they have more severe preoperative pain, they're at greater risk of postoperative pain, so that because of the activation of the central nervous system. And also, there are some studies showing that patients with neuropathic characteristics preoperatively are at greater risk of uh, postoperative neuropathic characteristics as well. And also another important factor, particularly um, which is of relevance in the clinical setting, is can we reduce the severity of acute postoperative pain? Because we know that those patients reporting more severe acute postop pain and also postop neuropathic characteristics are at greater risk of having chronic symptoms as well. So. We have done some work recently looking at persistent pain after breast cancer surgery and we have um, merged data sets. So we have taken data sets from three different research groups to merge them together to develop some prediction models. And these are the factors that came out from that work. So we know that women who have pain, more severe pain in the breast and the arm are at greater risk and also if they have a higher BMI. And also we know about um, intraoperatively, so axillary dissection intraoperatively is an important risk factor. Um, and so with that prediction model, we've now um, come up and developed a mobile app which is available for healthcare workers and surgeons and anaesthetists. So this can be used to enter in certain variables to give you the probability of a, a, a patient developing a chronic post-surgical pain. So really just to summarise, I've just given you a quick run through um, of where we've sort of come from really in the last 25 years or so. So that we know that it is a considerable burden. We have about between 10 and 30% of patients, but obviously severity and impact is variable. Um, it is important because um, if we think about the public health burden, because of the number of procedures that are now being conducted, um, and certainly in the UK, so for example, in uh, 2014, there were 7 million surgical procedures conducted in the UK, and this has jumped up to 10 million. So there's a year on year increase in the number of surgical procedures being undertaken for a number of reasons, partly because we're living longer and we're healthier and we can um, undergo anaesthesia in, or we can undertake anaesthesia in older patients as well. In terms of the research agenda, there's much more focus now on prevention and also refining these risk factors to identify patients who are likely to be at higher risk to work out whether we can um, identify them and target multimodal strategies here. So just a couple, I just want to finish on a couple of um, developments that have happened this year. So IASP have declared 2017 uh, as the global year against postoperative pain. So there have been a number of events and conferences just to raise awareness. Um, and this has been important, certainly has helped with research funding as well. Um, and also we have moved from having no definition 25 years ago, we do now have a standard accepted definition based on the early work by McCray and colleagues. Um, so there's a definition for surgical and post-traumatic pain and that uh, 
they're going to be included in the latest update of the World Health Organization ICD-10, which is due out next year. So this is the um, classification for all diseases and health states, and it's used widely throughout the world and translated into uh, over 40 languages. So we have come quite a way. And I just want to also acknowledge, just to finish off by acknowledging uh, Bill McRae, who's a retired uh, consultant anaesthetist from the University of Dundee. And he was one of the first in the UK, certainly the first anaesthetist in the UK, to raise awareness about the condition. Um, and he was writing about this 20 years ago. But if you go into PubMed now and do a search, you'll find... Um, I was in the other day and there were about 26,000 articles so he was really ahead of his time and he's enjoying beekeeping in uh, the north of Scotland so uh, I'll finish there. Thank you very much.